All right, I'm Evan Evans, and I'm here to talk to you about learning in the 21st century. So before we talk about learning in the 21st century, let's first take a brief history of learning. More importantly, how have we learned in the past? Well, let's go back to a little journey back in time to caveman days. Let's go back about 80,000 years. How did we learn initially when we were caveman? Well, the primary mode of learning at that point was through demonstration. You wanted to build a fire, you rubbed two sticks together, you demonstrated how you did it, and you passed that knowledge on to your other members of your tribe. But essentially, learning was an active uh, process. It was an active process passed on from one person to the other. And then over time, obviously, you know, we could rec they started recording this history, whether it be through paintings on their, on their caves, but essentially they started recording how to, how to do this, how to build a fire and, and other th knowledge too. And through cultural exchange, exchanging with other tribes or other cultures, over time they began to travel. And they traveled, when they traveled they started recording this stuff on scrolls. So you could pass, you could have the knowledge from one tribe and travel clear across, halfway across the world to another or civilization or another culture and be able to share that knowledge by what was written down in the scrolls. And over time then, these scrolls eventually found their ways into libraries. Now this is where learning changed a little bit. It changed from an active process to more passive process. That being the student then would go to these libraries and read these scrolls or these books, but the knowledge was essentially, it was a passive engagement with, with, the, with the knowledge out there. It was a passive learning experience. Then we get back to the Greeks and the Greek errors with the, uh, the great Socrates and the Socratic method. And essentially, knowledge now flipped to a more active process once again. Uh, through dialogue, the, the, the teacher would guide the student through a path of self-discovery, questioning themselves, answering questions. And it was a more active process once again. Then came the dawn of the university era with the University of Bologna back in 1088. And then obviously Oxford and Harvard and all these great universities. But once again, this pen they flipped to a more passive experience for the learner. There's two primary sources of information for these students. It was the professor and the textbooks. But all, overall, it was a passive experience for the student. They packed them into these lecture halls. So, as we can see, over time, we have flipped several times from active to passive uh, modes of learning. Question is, is it time for another change? According to the stats, it probably is. We're slipping that, uh, globally on the global education market. We're 25th and 24th for math and science. So we're slipping. We need a change. And ultimately, the question is then, what is this change? Well, the learning paradigm shift for the 21st century. That's what we need to try to find out and discover. One argument is the blended learning mythology, where you're combining this online and mobile and classroom learning all together. and includes all this, these, these forms of, of learning. Flipped classroom is one aspect of that. A flipped classroom is simply turning the traditional model upside down being what you would normally do in class, the traditional lecture, has, can now be recorded and uploaded to a video where the students can view outside of class. So when they come to class, they get into some more of the, the deeper thinking and critical thinking questions uh, or the material they can dive into because that's what has normally been reserved for outside of class, they can now do inside of class. So what is the flipped classroom? It is a form of blended learning. And besides that, blending learning ha utilizes both this passive and active forms of learning. It's combining both aspects. So it's beneficial to everybody. According to Bloom's taxonomy, what we're really doing is we're taking these lower levels of learning, which we normally would do in the lecture in class, and we're recording a video and uploading and making it available to students outside of class. So when they come to class, we're able to get to some of more of these applying, analyzing, and higher levels of learning which was normally reserved for outside of class. And this is where the students need the most work. So, so how do these, from books to podcasts, how does it work? Well, here's an example of a podcast that I've done in the past.
Okay, here I have a system of linear equations and two variables, and I'm asked to solve this system by graphing. In order to graph this... So what I'm doing here is, this is something that I would normally do in class, and I'm walking the students through an example, recording it and making it available to them outside of class. So when they come to class, they already have a base knowledge of the material, and we can dive into some of the more difficult problems. How do you flip, what do you need to flip a classroom? There's many options out there for us. To name a few, you have YouTube videos, you have iPads, Google+, VoiceThread, Storyline, Articulate. There's a whole bunch of things out there for us. Obviously, using the iPad, one technique you can do is you can create a quick podcast on the iPad. Here's an example of that. The verb hablar is an example of a regular AR verb in Spanish. Hablar, which means to speak. Notice that the infinitive ends in an A. So here's an example of a professor walking through a normal AR verb. So she made them available to the students before class so they can see it and see what they're going to accomplish in class. So when they get to class, they can get to some other AR verbs or more difficult ones and, and so they can get deeper into the lesson plan. Voice thread is another option for us out there. Voice thread is simply, it's almost like a PowerPoint. In my experience of teaching physical science for about 10 years, very few... It's essentially a PowerPoint. This, the professor can leave a voice message describing what the material that they're covering, highlight some notes. They can leave up here some uh, podcasts to help them, tutorials with them. And the neat thing about this is they can ask probing questions, and the students can then post their answers to those posing question, pro probing questions. They can either type them and leave their answers in, numer you know, in text, or they can actually record their voice and answer the questions as well. So it's another tool available for us to use. YouTube videos, obviously all you need is a camera and a microphone. And you go out, create a YouTube channel or a YouTube video, and then you can create playlists. If you have a YouTube channel, you can upload your videos. Here's an example of, of a stat class, chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3. So they have broken down by topics, and the students are expected to, to view those videos either outside, outside of class, before class, or even after class. If they didn't quite grasp the material, they can watch it again, and they can also use it for review when a test comes up. Other things you have, Google Plus. Google Plus is a, is really changing, the, is a game changer. It's a free multimedia social network. It's an extension of Google. And all you need to do this is a Gmail account. What does it look like? It looks like a traditional discussion board on a blackboard or whatever learning uh, system you're using, but it really has lots more bells and whistles. So not only can they leave text messages, they can also leave voice messages as well as videos, have a video conference, what's called a Hangout. And instead of being like Skype, we have one-on-one, -on -one, the advantage of Google Plus is you can have 10, on, 10 people participate in a Hangout at once. So it's a lot more flexible. And not only that, you can also upload things to this, such as here's an example of a student uploading their homework where they had questions. Uh, it was very difficult to type it, so they just took a photo of it, uploaded the photo, and he asked if he had any questions for you. So though that essentially an extension of Google Plus is really neat, we'll talk about in a little bit. So why do you use Flip Classroom? It truly facilitates the learning process. It combines both this active and passive learning experiences and allows time for more hands-on activities and critical thinking. So it's really been, it's really uh, the way of the future and it's getting it allows us to get to more of these higher levels of learning. So also, you can have things uh, develop. Uh, Larry Huff developed vector hours or vector session. And vector sessions are simply virtual engagement using computer technologies online and in real time. And what they look like, so you have vector hours, which is nothing more like a virtual vector office hour. You have vector lessons, which are recorded, pre-recorded, so students can view. And then you have these vector lectures, which students can uh, live interaction is essentially a live lecture. Here's an example of a vector hour. So here the professor is having a one-on-one -on -one interaction with the student online. And essentially it's what they would normally do in, on an office, face-to-face -face office hour, but it's taking place over the internet at a great distance. 
another option is the vector lecture. What I'm going to do is I'm going to first find, oops, pen, I'm going to first find my derivative. I'm going to find my derivative. Obviously, that gives me my 3x minus 18x minus 48. So here, the professor is having a lecture with six students at the same simultaneously. They can chime in, they can interact, and whenever they have a question, they can either uh, type text, type in their question, or they can just simply speak into the mic, and it, and they're able to ask live questions. And this is a lecture that is all all six students are at different places across the the state. So it's a form of distance learning. And again, is the whole idea is because these two last two the, these vector sessions are synchronous we've now really amped up the ability to to connect with the students and build relationships with the students so i hope you enjoyed this presentation again i'm evan evans and i look forward to seeing you down the road thank you so much